I'm so delighted. I don't know if I've ever had you on. Uh, Jody Evans, she's the co-founder of Code Pink. Uh, they have been in the fight probably longer than I've been alive, actually. Uh, but you're out there in Chicago, uh, and you are seeing what, what we are covering, which is the brutality that has been going on, I mean, in America for, for a long time, but particularly these past 10 months. Um, I just want to play this short clip to show people if they haven't seen what Chicago police have been doing to peaceful pro-Palestinian protesters. So that was just some of it. Uh, we got footage of them tasing people. We got footage of them beating people. And this is all going on while the feel-good vibes are going on inside uh, the, the United Center. Sure seems to be an altern alternate reality, Jody. Yeah, I've been living in both of the realities, and they are totally, extremely different. And, you know, I just left the rally in Union Park where you can feel the tension and the cops are around it. It's a peaceful rally and they just surround it. And, you know, what's interesting that's not in that is that that discourages people from coming out and being together at the rallies and the marches. And we saw it in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the, all the mainstream media, the Chicago papers, oh my God, it's gonna be Chicago 68 again and the cops are gonna be violent. So it's also a silencing of the voices that wanna come out and be together and stand for Palestine. It's, it, it's silencing. And could you kind of take people through that because you were inside last night, you had a sign. Uh, we know uh, we could show that on screen. Uh, we know that uh, on Monday they disappeared people <laughs> uh, that protested. Uh, people were yanking the sign from them. They were dimming the lights to try and hide that. Uh, but can you kind of take people inside, uh, which you were there last night? It sure seems like they just have like a quick reflex to try and just paper over that and act like there is no resistance and it's just a small fraction of people that care about this. Yeah, that seems to be their strategy this time. This is our 20th year at disrupting um, Democratic and Republican conventions. And this one is very different. First of all, they it looks like they've told the cameras that when there's a disruption to look away. We're used to when we disrupt the cameras all coming on us, but that is not what's happening. They are looking away. On Monday night, when the uncommitted delegates held up the Free Palestine banner, the cameras were told to look away. So, you know, they've been told disruptions are not what you're covering, just like they've told delegates to shut up, buck up, and get on the program. So it's very controlled in every way possible. No matter where we're disrupting, there are cops. Just spent four hours outside of the uh, Democrats for Israel event, 
uh, with all the mainstream Democrats coming in. And the cops were heavy on us, pushing back, you know, standing there with a banner, pushing back. Inside the convention, you know, they were on me in a minute, pulling me out and pulling out even the people that are photo phot the photographers that are with us. So they also get punished. Uh, I just disrupted um, Congressman Jamie Raskin at the climate um, caucus. All of us were pulled out together and, you know, all the passes taken away, et cetera. That's not happened in the past. This one, but there's never been quite a coronation like this or a production. This isn't democracy. I was at my first convention in 1974 as a delegate. I was 21 years old. And, um, you know, I know the difference between when there's some fights actually trying to happen and when there's some struggle, when there's some education, we have to remember when there's conflict, that's where education happens. That's where people learn. But if everyone's just told to be a sheep, there no one's learning anyone, anything. And I say that what we're doing is what democracy looks like. Right. And my last question, uh, you know, obviously you can't get in Biden's head, Harris's head, but this is not your first rodeo. It's not my first rodeo. I follow the money. I mean, Biden said he was going to pause the shipment to Israel a couple months ago. Then uh, one of the biggest donors to the Democratic Party, Haim Saban, uh, net worth of $3 billion, ardent Zionist. Uh, he stole the Power Rangers, by the way, <laughs> from, I think, uh, the Japanese. Uh, he huffed and puffed, and he uh, sent a, a harsh letter to Biden's uh, uh, top advisors. Uh, and that immediately was reversed. Uh, in those donor boxes, uh, you have VIP donors. They're having, you know, they have different passes than everybody else. Some of them happen to be Jewish. I'm Jewish, so I, I just call a spade a spade. But some of them happen to be Jewish, and some of them happen to be ardent Zionists. Jeffrey Katzenberg is the co-chair of Biden's campaign. Still, I believe, Harris's campaign, net worth just under a billion. Ardent Zionists, nothing wrong with being Jewish, but I happen to think, this might have something to do with why Biden and by extension, Harris, you know, seem to just be kind of going along to get along on this issue. Well, I mean, do you know, one of the things that's truly nauseating and infuriating is right after October 7th, Biden left the White House and went out to raise money. And every single host of those fundraisers was a Zionist, including Haim Saban. So he raised I think something like half a billion dollars on that. He was being funded by those who wanted to destroy Palestine. It was disgusting and gross on steroids. But, you know, that is the fun funding base of this election. And I always just, I always say, you know, democracy happens until you vote. And that's when you have a chance to use your voice, which is democracy. And so now is the time when people are like you're voting, you, who you're voting for. I'm like, you aren't going to know how to vote on November 3rd. And if we can't tell the, the world is changing so fast, who knows what it's going to look like? The pro-Palestinian movement was successful in getting Biden out of the race. But what we have to pay attention to is that that's when you have a chance to use your voice. As soon as you cast that vote, they own you. Right now, they need you. As soon as they're in, they own it. You are white noise. They don't really care what you talk, say. They are owned by the Zionists. They are owned by the rich. And they are owned by the military industrial complex. And at Code Pink, we have a campaign called Bought by Zionism. And if you want to know what your member of Congress or your senator is taken from the Zionist lobby, you can find it out there. And I encourage you to make phone calls and disrupt their offices, because right now is the only time you can make them uncomfortable. They need you. And my last question delves into a bit of the psychological, spiritual. But you've seen on the left uh, in recent years, a lot of people are dejected. A lot of people are just fed up. A lot of people don't know what direction to go. And they're just tired. They're tired of showing up to protest when it doesn't seem like anything's changing. Tired of direct action. Tired of knocking on doors. I mean, you, Medea Benjamin, uh, a lot of your other members, you've been going for 20, 30 years. How the hell 50, do you keep... 55. <laughs> oh, there you go. How the hell do you keep this up? I mean... Uh, how, what is your message to people that if it's Trump or Harris, I mean, people are just fed up and kind of a, a lot of people are starting to give up? Well, I say I stand on the shoulders of people who are more courageous than I'll ever have to be, including, you know, when I first read about, you know, Emma Goldman when I was maybe 15 years old. 
people that went to jail, people that were murdered. We forget the, you know, the history of this country and its genocide and slavery and violence against those who stand for equality and peace. So I don't, I, you know, very early in Code Pink, I realized, oh, we can't end war till we end the war economy. War just serves the war economy. So, and we're also can't be parsley on the plate of the system of the war economy, the extractive, destructive, oppressive economy that's killing you, your community and the planet. So it depends on like what you expect. The system is going to behave like the system and the people that work for the system are going to behave to serve the system. So you need to like have your efforts fit what reality is. And that's the reality. And so at Code Pink, we spend all our time like shining a light on the violence of the empire you live on, scratching at it, making sure it can feel that it's doing something wrong because it gets there's no friction to their madness. So we try to be friction and we try to be wake up calls. We try to hold them accountable and be there for their psyches to have to feel what they're doing to others. But you know, it's a very rare occasion, somebody who I call is on crack cocaine of power to not suck up to the money and the power. It's it's a crack cocaine. We have to remember that. And so it depends on, you know, what is your heart committed to? My heart's committed to the people uh, across the world, not in the just in the United States, but globally. I'm an internationalist. So I mean, right now, I feel so hopeful, you know, watching the world look at what happened to Ukraine. And when the U.S. sanctioned Russia, leaders in the rest of the world were like, if they can do that to Russia, we're screwed. So they really said, we have to have you get rid of this hegemony and start giving bricks more power. And then Palestine happens and the curtains are pulled back and everyone can see the violence of the power of the United States. And yes, it has nuclear weapons. It's the, you know, 70,000 ton elephant in the room that everyone's afraid of. But all I have is, you know, my heart to stand up in the face of it, as I've seen people do, you know, for a long time in the United States. Those are my inspiration. And it's, if the change doesn't happen in my lifetime, I feel like I'm keeping the light lit. I'm passing it down. I'm inspiring others. And while I'm doing that, I'm helping people cultivate a local peace economy. I see where all this has taken us as our kind of flood, but it's going to be a tsunami. You know, global inequality, global climate change, AI, fascism. We created all of that and nothing is happening to get in the way of it. So I say you have to build yourself an arc to get through it. And that's a local peace economy because we've forgotten how to be in community. We've forgotten how to be together and serve each other and actually fulfill the needs of humanity instead of be caught up in these proxies that don't serve our heart or our bellies. And I think when they force us to be in the fight with them, I call that a proxy because we're in a fight we can't win. But when you're in a when you're in a struggle together for values that are meaningful for your heart and you understand what the system is, it just nourishes you. It keeps you engaged. I mean, it keeps you young. <laughs> I mean, it, it, uh, it's what, you know, it's, we're, we're serving life. And when you think you're going to change a system that is that structurally settled and has all the money and all the weapons, it's, you know, it's about finding the cracks. And I would say right. the pro-Palestinian movement found the crack and really with those voices undermined the power you know, and the rest of the world is inspired by that. Let's remember when we do this, we're inspiring people globally. And that has happened. Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for hustling. I know you hustled for the protest over here. And uh, everybody uh, keep, in, keep, keep uh, in touch and keep an eye on Code Pink's uh, socials because they are certainly uh, rabble rousing as always at the DNC and elsewhere. Thanks again. Or join us at your member of Congress's office or in following Medea around the halls of Congress in D.C. We have a lot of work to do.